Okay, I introduce you Fausto Spoto, was a student with me at university a long time ago. And then he stayed at university, I moved down. And he will talk about uh, Java. Thanks for coming. And thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you everybody for, uh, for the invitation, Fabio, and everybody for coming. So basically I'm here because I'm going to talk about this nullness analysis that we have developed in Verona for Java. By, for Java. But more generally, I'm talking about uh, static analysis. Okay. <laughs> static analysis for Java. And uh, I would like to have also some information from you. I mean, while I talk, please stop me, because I want to know if you are interested in static analysis and which kind of interest you have, developers, testers, in static analysis. Not only Java, also C or C++. Okay, so I need to gather information. In case you want to find those slides, you can find them on the net at this address. Okay. So what is nullness analysis? Let us start from what is a null pointer exception. As you know very well, null pointer exception is a runtime exception that you have in Java. When you try to dereference a null pointer, you get an exception. The program stops, or at least an exception is raised, and uh, this happens when, for instance, some variable contains null, and then you call a method or you are access a field. You, you do a dereference operation. And uh, this is not nice. In general, this is not a nice situation. In C, you would have a segmentation fault, typically. But this is not a nice situation. Yes? Can compiler catch this situation? Yes, indeed. There's a... Basically, this is what <laughs> I'm talking about. The compiler does not catch it. Okay, the, you can compile this finally with a standard Java compiler, no problem at all. Then you run and it breaks. So null pointer exceptions are something bad. Usually, you don't want them. You can program by using null pointer exceptions if you want, but nobody does it. Okay, they are a bad sign. They are a sign that there is a fault in the program something which should not happen. It's very bad that uh, we write a program, we sell a program, and then the, the buyer comes to us because there is an null pointer exception. So we did something wrong in our program. It happens, of course, but it's not nice. So there are many situations when this can arise. In general, when you access a field, when you call an instance method, no problem with static methods. When you do a lock operation for multi-threaded operations, or when you throw an exception itself. If you do throw something, if something is null, you get an exception, null pointer exception. So there are four situations, basically, where you can have a null pointer exception in Java. So when I talk about this with some people, very often I get this answer. OK, but this has been solved. OK, we don't need to, to care about null pointer exceptions because there are tools such as Eclipse, that can find the null pointer errors automatically. Okay, that's what many people say. So uh, we should not solve anything. I should not come here because this problem has been solved. But this cannot be solved. As you know, null, nullness analysis, uh, which means uh, detecting null pointer exceptions statically before you run the program, is undecidable. Okay, you can prove it's undecidable. Then we can forget about uh, solving this problem. The only thing we can find is some approximation or some partial solution, which means that uh, some automatic tool can tell, okay, there is an alpha exception here, or maybe here, I don't know here. But only partial solutions. You cannot find a final solution, a complete solution. So, if you look at Eclipse, because everybody talks about this integrated environment to develop programs, okay, let us look at Eclipse and see what it does with null, pointer, with null pointers. Let us check if it is correct. Let us check how much precise it is, okay? How partial is the solution that it gives? So I started from something very simple, the previous example, okay, should catch it. I write null inside a variable, then I access a field of the variable. And actually, if you write this inside Eclipse, you get a warning. You can select a plugin of Eclipse to start nullness analysis, and you get a warning there. 
it tells you that variable o can only be null okay so it's sure that this is null and this is an error typically so this is good let's try something a bit more complex for instance let's try to create a variable which may which may be null not necessarily sometimes for instance we can check if the args array is length uh, is longer than three in such a case we write something inside the variable o otherwise we keep null in this case you don't know if an o is null or not you don't know before you run the program okay and in this case eclipse actually tells you that o may be null which is correct it's fine okay may be null it's not sure but it's possible so this is fine also let's try to do something more complex now we check for nullness before accessing o.c okay if we check for nullness it should be fine because we never the reference o when it's null and actually eclipse is so clever that it can find this situation so it does not give any warning at all now okay very clever but then if you complicate some more it fails so you try for instance to copy o into a temporary p and then you check p and affect o it does not realize that uh, o is safe there is something which is non null here so it, give, uh, it gives you a warning which is useless it's not a real warning it's a fake warning if you want it's a false alarm but in this case we can say that it is imprecise as i told you before we cannot pretend to be complete it will be imprecise this is a situation where it is imprecise but in my opinion this is a bit stupid because it should somehow track how values flow in the program while well, it does not not completely at least let's try something else this is much better much worse so now we create again an object or class c we write inside the variable o and then we access o.c.c since the constructor does not initialize c you will find a null inside o.c and when you dereference again o.c.c you will get an exception at runtime okay here there is an exception at the runtime the problem is that eclipse doesn't say anything so you cannot trust him if we if the idea is that that when i don't get any warning then everything is safe i don't get any warning but it's not safe so this is something bad because it, this means that we cannot use eclipse to prove by 100 percent sure that there is no exception at runtime so this is an imprecision fine this is an incorrectness not fine at all we cannot accept incorrectness and there are other situations when eclipse is incorrect for instance here um, so in this case you pass null as a parameter to the function foo and then inside the function you dereference the parameter it does not understand that you pass null here you get an exception at runtime eclipse doesn't say anything so again incorrection number two in conclusion okay eclipse does something but eclipse is not precise sometimes it's a bit stupid when you copy variables for instance and it has some incorrect hypothesis namely it assumes that uh, uh, when you call a method the parameters are non null and that inside fields you, al you always find something which is non null it is not true always but for eclipse it is so we should need something better we want something better because as programmers as testers we want an automatic tool such that if we run the tool and it says okay it is okay so we want something which is correct really correct 100 percent correct and possibly more precise than eclipse not so stupid like in that situation where i copied a variable is it possible yes many people try to do it so in the last years there has been research in the static analysis community about this problem 
Here I give you a few papers, but there are more than this. And uh, for instance, uh, this Houdini, Houdini system is able to find the main null pointer exception errors at compile time before you run the program. And similarly, you have uh, this other tool inside this paper, finding more null pointer bugs, but not, not too many. And it can be used to find the null pointer exceptions. However, they are not correct. So they are based on heuristics, on uh, statistical hypotheses, but they are not correct. Sometimes they go wrong. There are other papers talking about correct uh, analysis. For instance, number five, number three, and number two. But as you can see from the titles, you have to provide uh, some manual annotation to the program. So it is not really Java, it's Java with annotations. You write uh, something like, this should be non-null, this field is non-null, this parameter is non-null. You have to write it as a programmer, and then it can verify it. So it's not automatic in the sense that you have to do some work before you can run the tool. In the very last time, in the last month here, number two, a new paper arrived based on number one, and in this number two, you have a tool which is able to prove automatically, without annotations, that the Java programs have non-null pointer bugs. This tool is called NIT, NIT. It has been developed in France by those three people, Hubert, Jensen, and Pichardy. And it works quite well. So I tried the tool, you can find many bugs. I will show you soon. But as I will show you, we can do better. Okay, but this is, in my opinion, the first tool which really does the job, okay, in a good way. And it is based on number one, which is a, an old paper by Cuso and Cuso. They were the first people who started working in abstract interpretation, which is a theory, mathematical theory, to develop aesthetic analysis. So number one is theoretically interesting, but practically useless. Number two uses the results of number one to find something which is practically useful. Okay. So let's try to find something where even NIT is not able to find a correct answer. Look at this program. Now it's a bit more complex. The question is, uh, is the call to hash code able to throw an null pointer exception? So is it possible that the, when I call hash code here, I get an null pointer exception or not? Okay, the answer is below, but <laughs> it's not possible. At that call, I'm talking about that call, the call to hash code. It will never throw an null pointer exception. Why? So, so let's try to reason. Variable O may be null, because it is null at the beginning, and then it may become not null, but I don't know. Okay, so variable O is dangerous, it may be null. Then I pass O to set D, and then variable O goes inside the field D. So it seems that the field D might become dangerous. And when I call p.d, there might be an exception. It seems, but it is not true. Because if o is null, then the previous call to set c would throw an exception here. Because o is null, then c is null, then c.c .c gives an exception. So if you reach set d, there was ne no exception at set c. Hence, O is not null. So you can see it's a kind of reasoning where you have to reason about uh, if I reach this program point, what I know. I know that O is not null because otherwise set C would throw an exception. And I don't reach the statement. If we try this, if we try to analyze this program, NIT will tell us that maybe there is an null pointer exception at an hash code, so it's not so clever to find this uh, reasoning. We will see it soon. And there is no tool able to find that 
there is no exception there. Let us look at another difficult example. This is simpler, actually. Here we call foo twice, function foo. First time we pass null, second time we pass something which is not null. Function foo is really simple, it just uh, returns its parameter. So the first time you get null from foo, the second time you get the new c from foo. And the second time if you call hash code, of course you don't get an exception because you get the new c itself. Okay, no problem, there is no exception here, never. However, all tools like NIT in it will, will tell you that uh, maybe there is an exception at hash code because they cannot distinguish the two cores. In some, in some way, they merge the two cores. They do a consistent hypothesis about the two cores. And they say, since the first time you pass null and you return null, maybe also the second time you return null. Okay, they merge the two. And this is too imprecise. Seems stupid, but this is reality, actually. <laughs> so we should find something more interesting, more, more intelligent, something which is called in static analysis uh, context-sensitive which means that the result of foo can be different depending on the context. If I pass null, I get a result. If I pass something else, I get another result. Okay, this something else, of course, is the tool Julia that I'm going to introduce now. This tool has been developed uh, in the last five years by me and a few friends in Verona and other universities in France. It is a general system to do static analysis of Java. So it is not just for nullness analysis, it is for many analysis, but also nullness analysis. It, it should be applied to Java bytecode, actually. So uh, instead of the source code, you should analyze the Java bytecode. Of course, you can compile the source code into Java bytecode and then analyze it. So you can analyze both, both Java bytecode and Java. And you can analyze everything which can be compiled into Java bytecode, any other language if you want. It is formally correct, so the results are correct, you can trust them, if I did not do any error, of course. It is efficient, we did our best to make it efficient, which means that we can analyze programs which are not just hello world. We managed to analyze programs up to 10,000 methods, for instance, methods. Which, is, which starts to be a realistic size. We have to do better, but this is which starts to be realistic. Generic means that we can use it for many things. I'm going to talk about nullness analysis, but remember, there are other kinds of analysis that you can do and can be built in the future. Yes? Just a quick question. Yeah, yeah. No link to any native inclusion. Uh, ah, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. If your software includes native methods, then the analysis might be incorrect. So, uh, because usually it does a worst case uh, assumption about the native methods, something like I assume the worst scenario. Okay, the worst. Uh, it is, sorry? It is handled, I mean, yes, with a worst case uh, scenario. Uh, but this hypothesis, in many cases, is too bad and you get no result. Okay, so with native methods it's useless or it might be imprecise. And this is why uh, you can only use native methods from the standard Java classes because I provided the manual information about the native methods. Okay, I spent a few months writing all native methods <laughs> and what they do. But if you try to analyze something which includes a C library, for instance, you can forget. Okay, this is not for this. I'm sorry. Try with a C analyzer. <laughs> So which is the correctness guarantee here is that if the tool says it's okay, then you can sell the program it's okay, okay? You can trust it. Since, of course, the property is undecidable, there will be cases when you get a warning, which is a fake warning, okay? In many cases, you will get a warning by Julia saying that there might be a problem here, but actually there is no problem there. And this is called a false alarm. The, the goal is to limit the number of false alarms. Because if you get 1,000 false alarms, you will say, okay, I throw away Julia, we'll never use this tool. 
But if you get a three false alarms, 10 false alarms, then you can check your application and check, okay, it was not intelligent, but actually 10 checks are okay. 1,000 are not okay. I will never do 1,000 checks manually because the tool has not been able to do it. So we should limit the false alarms. Let's play again. Let's try with the same examples as before. We had this simple one. And of course, uh, if you compare Eclipse, Neat, and Julia, they give you the same results, which means it's dangerous. So there is an error there. Okay, so we, they agree on this example. They agree on this other example, example number two, where you don't know if O is null. Okay. Here we get something which is more precise in Julia than in Neat. If we check for nullness of O, Julia understands that there is no problem, while uh, strangely, Neat says that there is a problem possibly. This is a false alarm of Neat, while Julia seems more precise here. We had uh, some more other examples before. This one, for instance, when we copied O into P, we checked P and we accessed O. Okay, Eclipse gives a false alarm. Neat gives a false alarm. Julia gives no alarm. So this is fine. Now he's able to understand this situation also, the tool. Let's try with the other examples. We had this one. If you remember here, uh, the field C is null. So when you dereference O.C.C, you get an exception at runtime. Eclipse was wrong was incorrect because it didn't issue any warning. But both Neat and Julia give you the right warning. Fine. Some more example here. If you basically you start from this one and you initialize the field with something which is definitely non null like this. And then the warning are gone. OK, good. This was the last, uh, no, yes, okay. So in this case here, you pass the null, if you remember, and then the parameter is the reference at inside the function. Eclipse did not give any warning, so it was incorrect, but both Neat and Julia give the right warnings. We can trust them. And finally, we modify the example a bit because instead of passing null, we pass something which is not null, new C, and the warnings are gone. Okay, so it seems to work quite well. Let us go to the difficult examples now. We had uh, two difficult examples. The first one, it was the strange example where if you write something inside D, then a set C is not thrown an exception, so O is not null. Okay. Eclipse, no warning. This is incorrect. Because inside the set C, there might be a null pointer exception if O is null. Okay, set C, O might be null. So inside the set C, you write inside the field C, there might be an exception. Incorrect for Eclipse. Neat, you get two warnings. One at set C, fine. One inside main for hash code. This is a false alarm. Julia, you only get the warning inside the set C. So it has been intelligent, so intelligent to find that there is no problem with hash code. This is an example where Julia is more precise than Neat, for instance. You get less warnings. We had the other difficult example where you call foo with null and then with sand which is not null. And uh, in the second case, you call hash code on the result. Now Julia is able to say that there is no warning, there is no problem here, while Neat gives you a fake warning, a false alarm for hash code. Eclipse does not say anything, does not say anything, never. <laughs> Actually, it's cheating because, uh, for instance, if you pass null now here, he continues to say, okay, there is no warning. <laughs> okay, he's cheating. <laughs> While uh, now, if you compare this with this, Julia gives you a warning now, if you pass null also the second time. 
So, right. It seems that Julia is more precise than neat. It should be correct. Theoretically, it should be. Uh, here I have a table showing the difference for large examples, not just small applications. So I have uh, seven programs. The size reaches uh, 2,000 methods, I think, for Julia. So Julia is analyzing itself. And uh, here you get the time of the analysis with Julia, the time of the analysis with NEAT, and then you get the amount of field reading, field writing, and method calls that are safe according to Julia and according to NEAT. Okay, they are proved safe. And you can see that uh, Julia is always uh, more precise than NEAT. Okay. 72 compared to 68 and so on. You can compare case by case. It is also faster. You can compare this column with this column. And in some cases, I had some problem. I don't know why. Some bug, probably. Well, I had no problem with Julia. So it seems that the tool looks superior from this point of view. OK. And now. I'm going to give you a few intuition and then the intuition about uh, what is inside this nullness analysis inside Julia, how it works. Uh, there is a paper about this, so in case you are really interested in all the mathematical boring stuff about nullness analysis, uh, look at the paper in my web page and read it and tell me. But I will give you just the intuition of what is going on. The intuition is that uh, for every statement you have in the program, Julia builds a Boolean formula. And the Boolean formula expresses uh, how nullness behave in the statement between and after the execution of the statement. For instance, look at this statement here where you copy O inside P. Julia builds this formula for that statement. When you have this hat on the left, it means input. When you have the hat on the other side means output. Input means uh, before the statement, output after the statement. So the intuition is uh, for this statement, let's start from here. If O was null before the statement, then it is null after the statement and vice versa, if and only if. If O was null before the statement, then P is null after the statement and vice versa. And if args was null before the statement, then args is null after the statement, and vice versa. So it gives you all the possible uh, nullness behaviors of this statement. You have to consider all the variables which are in scope there and build a Boolean formula for all those variables. You do it for each statement in the program. And then you merge all these formulas into one formula for each method. So you compose sequentially the formulas. The composition means that you match the output of a statement with the input of the following statement. And then you remove the matched variables. So if you compose, compose, compose for all the statements of a method, you get a Boolean formula for each method body. In case you have method calls, you have to uh, go inside the called method, build the formula for the called method body, and plug it in the calling point. Usually, you have to rename the variables accordingly. And if you have loops and recursion, like traditional, you have to do some kind of fixed point. Okay, because if a method calls itself, and if to analyze a method, I have to go inside the method body, in case of recursion, you have an infinite process. OK, this infinite process becomes a fixed point in mathematical terms. Um, there are techniques to compute fixed points automatically. The same happens for loops. Loops are uh, basically the same thing as uh, method calls. They are not so different after all. So this is the idea. And uh, the only difficulty is in uh, providing Boolean formulas for each statement. So if you look at the paper, uh, that I have in my web page, for each statement you get the formula on the right. Actually, since I work at the Java bytecode level, for each bytecode you get the formula on the right. And then you compose everything. That's all. Like 
um, as, I, as an example here, consider again the exa one of the examples before. Uh, here we call the foo twice, once with null, the second time with uh, something which is not null. The idea is that we start by computing the formula for the body of foo. The body of foo is just return the parameter. So the formula for the body is if the parameter was not null, if C was not null, sorry, was null, then the result is null and vice versa, right? Because foo just returns the parameter. So the result is null if and only if the parameter is null. And then you plug this formula wherever you call foo. You, in the first call, since you pass null, then you plug null inside C and you get the result. And then you get this uh, arcs that does not change for all the other variables you have to say they don't change. While the second time, since you pass something which is not null, you get not null result and all other variables don't change. Yes? No, uh, the formulas talk only about variables. So they don't talk about the fields of the objects. Okay, you have a, um, a name, I don't know, you have a C, result, arcs, whatever, but only for the variables in the program, in the methods, not for the fields. So you consider that only within a method code, not within all uh, the Yes, we will see immediately now there is a slide about the fields because uh, as I present the work now, you have uh, no information about the fields. You only have information about the nullness or non-nullness of the variables. So if you have a field reading, get field in Java bytecode, you just say, I don't know. Okay, and this is imprecise. And of course, if you don't have any information for the fields, we can take Julia and throw it away because uh, real programs use fields. So we have to find a solution for the fields. And this is our solution. So I call the oracle-based solution. An oracle is something that gives you an answer when you don't know it. So the oracle here is a set of fields, something like field C of class D, field F of class E, and so on, a set of fields. They are assumed to be non-null which means that inside of field, those fields, you always find something which is not null. This is an oracle, okay? Something that gives you information about the fields, which are surely not null, 100%. If you start from a very optimistic oracle, an oracle telling all fields are non null, very optimistic, and you compute our static analysis, Usually you get uh, uh, some information about what you write inside the fields. So you start from everything is non-null inside the fields, you apply your analysis, and you conclude that you write something which is not null inside some fields. Then you can remove those fields. So you remove those fields from the oracle. And you start again the analysis. And you find that some other fields may be not null. And you remove those fields. Then you start again the analysis, and you find that some more fields may be not null, and you remove those fields from the oracle. Finally, you reach a fixed point, so you, your analysis stabilizes, you don't remove any more fields, and this final oracle, where you have removed and removed and removed and removed, is, uh, by a theorem, is correct in the sense that uh, the fields you have inside that final oracle are really not null in the program. So the idea is, again, you start from the optimistic hypothesis, every, everything is not null inside the fields. You compute the analysis, you if you find a counterexample, you remove the field. If you find another counterexample, you remove the field until you don't find any more co counterexamples. This way of working is uh, quite precise it seems a bit dangerous from the point of view of complexity because our analysis can take some time, of course. If you have to apply this iterative approach 100 times, it will take a lot of time. 
But in practice, I don't know if I have a... <laughs> in practice, the number of iterations before the Oracle stabilizes is two, three, four. I never found more than four, even for large programs. Moreover, if you use caching for the operations, the first analysis may be expensive, but the second, third, fourth analysis are, is very fast because you cached all the operations. And I will show you an example, I hope. I hope. Okay. So with this Oracle-based approach, we can find also those fields which are always 100% non-null, and now the analysis starts to be interesting. Of course, the reality is more complex. Uh, uh, you can imagine that uh, if you consider the bytecode instead of source code, it's more difficult because the bytecode has no structure and uh, you have a stack and so on. Also, you have exceptions, and I did not talk about exception here, but you have two when you write the tool. So in the paper, we talk about exceptions also. Boolean formulas. You must represent Boolean formulas in an intelligent way, or otherwise your analysis will take one year. There are ways to represent the Boolean formulas as binary decision diagrams, which are very efficient data structures. Also, I told you we need caching, because otherwise the analysis is too slow and the many iterations will be too slow. And for native methods, <laughs> okay, we have to provide manual annotation for them. This is a real mess. It's really complex and boring. And in particular, there are kinds of native methods you can forget, like reflective methods. Where if you use reflection, then you can do whatever you do, you want. You can modify your program, for instance. And uh, then you can forget about static analysis. Yes? What threads? This analysis is correct also for multi-threaded application. But more complex analysis, in general, not. So this is a simple analysis. But if you do more complex analysis, really multi-threaded applications are difficult to deal well, with. So basically, you might have first warnings, but mm -hmm. if there are no warnings, it's going to be okay. Yes, it is. If you don't use, nat you don't use native methods, which are not uh, in the list, okay. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you mean if I have library methods like the, la the methods for strings, for instance, what happens? Uh, uh, so, so if you have an interface which has a method foo, and okay. you have different types of interface, and you don't know okay. that the system will be called. You assume you call all. Okay. And if you want, you can do something better. You can apply some kind of uh, mm, target restriction. Okay. You can uh, find the a subset of all the possible targets that you call at runtime. Julia does it. Okay, you restrict as much as you can the number of targets for each interface method, for each virtual method in general. All right. Uh, yes. Yes, indeed. You, you can analyze. You cannot analyze this. Sorry. <laughs> yes, because uh, because if Julia find, finds a native method which is not in the list of uh, manually provided native methods, then it gives you a warning, and then it's your decision if you want to continue or not. <laughs> okay, there are limitations. Of course, there are always limitations. These examples, the example we saw before, was fine. Here, Julia does not give any warning because you check for nullness of O before you access O. But if you change the bit, if you check nullness of a field before you access the field, then you get a warning here. So instead of O, now I write X dot C. Here you get a warning. Because C is not a field that the Oracle finds as always non-null, and uh, he is not so intelligent to understand this. What we need is to remember the set of fields which are definitely non-null. So we should remember that uh, here, x.c was not null, so it's safe. 
it is not so easy after all because you can modify the field in the middle for instance even by sharing so it's not so obvious and this is what we are working at at the moment we want to improve this because we think that if we improve this we should half the number of uh, false alarms so we want to improve this this is work in progress really now in these days Not at the moment, because we analyze pure Java bytecode. But maybe in the future we can assume that you, you can write... S yeah, you get annotations. We can define an annotation for the bytecode and tell Julia to believe the annotations. This is technically easy to do it. If, if it can be useful, yes, it's possible to do it. But at the moment I want to do it automatically. And then for the last 3% uh, of false alarms, maybe annotations are the right solution at the end. Okay. Yes, there are still too many. Yes, indeed. There are too many. At the moment, there are too many. That's why I want to solve this limitation here and this other limitation here. This is uh, really impressive. If you write something inside the field C and then you access field C or field C, you don't get any exception. And Julia does not give you any warning. But if you write a null and then you change your mind, and you write this, Julia thinks that uh, this is dangerous. <laughs> okay? Because the oracle misses C, while uh, here you get C in the oracle. Of course, this is stupid, we should find a solution. Let's yeah. Yes. No way, we will not understand. Because you can only talk about nullness and not about a property which is somehow related to nullness. Yeah. So there will, there will uh, be always a situation where it's not so clever. Always. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you cannot do it. We should need maybe some kind of symbolic reasoning, but the moment. <laughs> So in the last minute, I will give you just uh, the structure of Julia. Okay, you have this abstract interpretation engine. You have the library bcell to access the bytecode, to, to deal with the bytecode. And then you can plug analysis as many as you want. We have a seven, eight at the moment. And they can use their libraries. This is a library for binary decision diagrams, for instance. So you can add. This is five years of development. Okay, it works if you don't have reflection, quite fast, okay, up to 10,000 methods. And it has been used for some industrial application by Ionix. Uh, it's a company in California. They want to do uh, information flow analysis of Java. Okay, so they asked me to develop an Astra domain for this. And uh, now we are trying to, to establish a spin-off in our university with the help of the Parma University and Reunion University in France because my colleagues are based there. And we hope to manage. I'm not sure, but <laughs> we will see if this is possible. We can do nullness, we can do sharing analysis, which means that we can find if data structures can share something. Okay, so if you modify one, then you modify also the other indirectly. Cyclicity analysis, if a data structure might contain a loop, like a list with a loop, uh, class initialization analysis, uh, which classes have been initialized in each program point. Uh, and the termination analysis, which is the most complex analysis we have at the moment. We want to find if the methods terminate. Of course, this is a bit undecidable, but uh, it works in many cases. Okay, I would like to give you an example, but maybe one minute. Okay, you have this program. This is an example of termination. The pro this program with a simple, for a simple list of uh, objects, you have head and tail. And the append method is a traditional append method in the sense that uh, it checks if tail is null. In that case, uh, you 
append the other list to the head. If the tail is not null, you append the other list to the tail and you add the head and you add the head in front. Okay, so it's a recursive append for lists. If you write a simple a simple program with two lists and then you call append, Julia tells you incredible that append terminates. It seems stupid, but it is not so stupid because for instance, if there is a loop inside the list one, then the program does not terminate. Okay. So let's try. We create a loop inside list two. Is uh, creates a loop, and Julia keeps telling that uh, append terminates. This is true because list two is not important for termination. Only list one. But if we create the loop on list one, now it tells that uh, it might not terminate. <laughs> okay. So as you see. Termination analysis is incredibly complex because you have to deal with the cyclicity, sharing of data structures, and uh, many other kind of information. And you have to prove that something decreases when you do a recursion or when you have a loop. It's not easy at all, but we managed to do some something. We are improving. So now we are improving the precision analysis of termination analysis. We would like to improve the efficiency also. And uh, the dream is to create a plugin that we can uh, use inside Eclipse, at least for nullness analysis. And maybe there are other analyses which are important in the future. So here I want to ask you, what do you need <laughs> when you program? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> what do you need? Sorry. C++. C++. <laughs> well. <laughs> Yes, this is uh, maybe too much at the moment, but <laughs> we can approximate the result. Maybe information about the exceptions that each method can throw, even um, unchecked exceptions. Might be interesting. Or checking some JML annotations like modified fields or uh, pure methods, something like this. This might be interesting. I don't know. But it does, in order to do that, it is doing um, a bytecode analysis, uh, looking at the um, method complexity, uh, uh, cyclic, cyclic, cyclic yeah. complexity. So that might be something in my favor to mm -hmm. But that was uh, Testability Explorer. Justability. Testability. Test testability. Yeah, testability right. Explorer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have any document about this? Any public document? I don't know. It is. It's, it's, it's open source and it's public. Right. Yeah. I can, I can yes, I need some information about this. I'm interested. And if you have patience for <laughs> one minute, I was also interested in this project of yours, which is Android, because uh, uh, the information you can get about Android on the net is that it is relatively simple from the point of view libraries, at least compared to Java. You have less native methods. Here I don't understand. Do you have native methods? Do you have less? You don't have at all? How was the situation? Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> So I hope you don't have it all, but at least I hope you don't have reflection. It seems don't. And uh, also, Android uh, applications are translated into Java bytecode and then into Dalvik, the bytecode, which is similar to Java bytecode. So it seems like a good point where you can apply static analysis, because it's a bit simpler than Java. And. Uh, I hope to have the time to integrate Julia with Android, so to use Julia to verify applications in Android and also to, to optimize the compilation from Java bytecode into Dalvik bytecode. But I don't know if you have interest in this, if anybody has thought about this. Maybe people working at Android are not here, but... Because, for instance, in the case of nullness, if you find that something does not throw any null pointer exception, you don't need to check in the bytecode, uh, for instance. Or if you find that, uh, 
I don't know, some field is always a constant. You can do constant propagation, things like this. So traditional compiler optimizations. From bytecode to which bytecode? No, to Java bytecode. Again, to Java bytecode, again. Right? In theory, it's possible with Julia at the moment. So after the analysis, you can dump the Java bytecode again. Yeah. And you get another application which runs. But uh, consider that the Java bytecode is quite strict. For instance, you cannot remo remove the nullness checks. You don't have bytecodes that don't check. Ah, okay. <laughs> so I should define a new bytecode ah, okay. where there are no checks. So it's, uh, you cannot do very much with Java Byte because it's really strict. So it's, like it's, like it's, like it's, like it's sensible if you compile in something which is uh, more general or into native code. Why well, actually if you produce warnings that uh, if some uh, null check is not necessary, you can produce a warning that uh, this variable can never be null. So that's up to the, the execute logic. Okay, the opposite so you mean. Uh, this variable can never be null. Yeah, yeah. For, for example, if there is uh, some null, in, null mm -hmm. check in the code and you know that it okay. can Yeah, this might be a, a new idea, yes. It's technically easy at the moment, but I didn't think about this, yes. Yeah, it might be interesting. Or remove it from yeah, also remove it from the compilation. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least inform the user, inform the programmer, yes. Because we want to analyze uh, programs from the net, downloaded from the net. So if you download an application, you have the source code, you want to analyze it. So for instance, we want to analyze applications going to a mobile phone where you don't have the source, or you don't need to have the source. So you are more general in some way. But it's true that the Java bytecode is more difficult. You lose a bit of information, like final if you variables. Have the source code as well, can you, uh, Sorry? Can you, if you have the source code as well, can you use that? It's theoretically possible, but at the moment it's not. Uh, it's not done. Yeah, it's not modified. Yes, this is true. But uh, maybe if you have this information, then you can improve the analysis. Otherwise, your analysis must be so clever to understand it. Okay. So thank you. And if you want to play with the termination analyzer, we have a web page where you give the class and it tells you if it terminates or not. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we are doing the same for nullness analysis. I hope in a few weeks the nullness analyzer will be online as a web page, web interface. So thank you. And if you have uh, more questions, <laughs> even offline, I'm interested.